All right, hi everyone. Still have some people logging in here, so I'll give it another 30 seconds. Uh, meanwhile, I'll introduce who's on the call with us today. So myself uh, out of New York, we have uh, Chris Garens up there in a hotel currently in Toronto, but but does hail out of uh, Vancouver. Uh, and you can see DJ here out of the Chicago area. And then we have uh, Simon uh, hailing from the, uh, the mothership in uh, London HQ. So they'll be on the call to uh, answer any questions uh, that are coming in during the webinar and then after during the Q&A session. All right, might as well get into it here. So I'm actually also going to kill my video to keep the bandwidth uh, optimal as we go through. All right, yeah, so welcome. So this is the third uh, RAIL webinar that we're hosting this week. Uh, today we'll be focusing on wireless monitoring for TRAC. On Tuesday, uh, I had Chris Garens on here. Um, he covered structures, uh, tunnels, uh, bridges, various rail infrastructure. Uh, if you want a copy of that one, you can uh, message me. We can get you the video recording of that. Uh, yesterday, we had Simon Brightwell on, and he covered earthworks monitoring and how our solutions apply to uh, monitoring for slope instability around rail infrastructure. Uh, again, if you want a copy of that, feel free to message us and we'll get that over to you. And then today to, to wrap up the week and the third area of where we uh, provide solutions for, for monitoring around rail infrastructure is track. So I think first, uh, it's probably a good idea to define wireless remote condition monitoring. So first, um, probably foremost is gonna be no cabling. So between sensors where the measurement is being taken on site and then to the data hub where data is then being trans, uh, transferred and sent back to a software for viewing, uh, manipulation, et cetera. It needs to be from a distance, so no need to be there to be on site, uh, you know, to collect any measurements manually on site. It has to be continuous, regular, uh, with automated measurements of parameters. Normally these parameters are preset and understood by the stakeholder, uh, by the project engineer on what frequency measurements need to be taken. Um, and then the goal of wireless remote condition monitoring is of course to obtain the status, uh, performance or behavior of something, a structure, uh, a track bed in this case, which you can see on the left-hand side. Quickly to comment on the photos here, so you can see this is of course a uh, rail we have the uh, tilt sensor nodes, the track bed tilt sensor nodes installed there in about 10 foot increments. And you can see a zoom in photo of two of our type of track bed tilt sensor nodes. So what's the value of wireless remote condition monitoring? So to highlight, you know, what we have five points here, uh, ease of installation, it's cable free. There's no need to run cables along the track, um, dig underneath the rail, trench along the rail or along the track bed. Um, the data hub where all the data communicates wirelessly to uh, needs to be and normally is solar powered. Uh, so no need to run mains power from any cabinets uh, that could be in the area, um, any offices nearby, everything solar powered, remote and standalone. Um, the value of it, um, safety. So reduces boots on ballast, uh, reduces the need to send crews on site in adverse weather overnight, um, you know, during rainstorms, uh, you know, in dark territory where it could be, you know, unsafe to be walking along uh, the track. Uh, it's re regular and repeatable data. So receiving data um, when you need it, when you want it, uh, in all weather conditions at all times through the night. You know, this uh, instrumentation is designed to be to be rugged, to be standalone, um, and to be reliable in the way of receiving data uh, that matters. Uh, maintenance light, I won't say maintenance free. There's no instrumentation system uh, on the market that is completely maintenance free, but maintenance light. Uh, no regular cleaning is needed. 
you know, in the case of survey, um, you know, we need to make sure that, you know, prism glass and, and total station um, uh, glass and lens are, are clean. Uh, other systems where we have cabling in place uh, need to make sure that the cable is not, you know, tripped or, or dug up or, or broken. Um, so maintenance light. And uh, it's near real time data. So it's receiving information within minutes of measurement uh, rather than needing to deploy a crew or, or equipment along the rail to obtain measurements. It's coming in near real time. So with that, now looking at our flat mesh and sensor technology, uh, we do have two platforms, one flat mesh and one GeoWAN. Uh, for the rail environment, 95% of the time, we do recommend our, our flat mesh platform, which has some unique uh, features designed for um, and benefited by the, the rail industry. And then, of course, our associated sensor technology. Okay, so uh, this, this figure here shows a typical installation of uh, different types of instrumentation around rail infrastructure. Uh, the same image was used on the previous two uh, sessions, uh, the first being the, the structures one where, uh, you know, tunnels uh, was covered. So this image was used here. You can see the tunnels there. Uh, and then the second one yesterday was earthworks around slope instability and how our flat mesh uh, platform does have um, unique features which allow for uh, near real time notification with alerts and camera images in the case of uh, slope failure. Um, and then today, of course, we're, we're looking at track. So there's uh, probably four is four primary products uh, that we'll focus on in this session. The first uh, being on the left, you can see installed here on the cross tie itself is a triaxial track bed tilt sensor uh, designed to um, and benefits you to have uh, remote monitoring of, of track geometry um, parameters. The second right here on the bottom middle of the screen is going to be a we call it a PT100 node. It allows you to remotely obtain the rail temperature it has an external sensor there you can see a little bead on the left which is attached to the uh, the rail itself um, either by epoxy um, or magnetic we have uh, a couple options there uh, this node actually also has the ability to not only obtain the rail temperature but also the the tilt the triaxial tilt um, of whatever it's installed to in this case it's the cross tie of course um, next here on the image is the gateway device so this is the data backhole. This is what contains the uh, cellular modem um, and allows for uh, local data storage buffering in the case where a cellular connection is not available, um, data can be held locally for someone to download. And if there is cellular connection or reception, uh, then of course that'll be transmitted remotely to the software. Uh, this is the solar panel. Normally we Recommend a 20 watt solar panel uh, for more, most North American latitudes. You know, if we're going further up in, in Canada, um, you know, we may look at something maybe 30 watt, 45 watt, depending on, on the latitude and available daylight hours. And then fourth being the ODS sensor, which uh, has a lot of application around structures um, as well as track bed, um, which I'll cover uh, in the next slide here. So first looking at the track bed tilt sensor. So you can see here on the left, uh, there's a track bed tilt sensor. This is a high G variant of the uh, triaxial tilt sensor installed here on a wooden tie. Um, you can see some, um, some, white, um, some white polymer adhesive is what we recommend for both wooden and concrete ties, along with uh, wooden screws to really securely attach uh, to the wooden tie because you really never know. Um, when deploying out on a project, you know, the condition of that. So uh, we always provide to our customers, uh, you know, the accessories definitely required uh, for proper installation. So again, this is the triaxial tilt sensor with a high G sensor. So the high G um, is a unique feature available with Sensi's tilt technology, which allows it to withstand uh, high vibration induced on the cross ties. Um, when trains pass or in the case on rail bridges uh, where there's higher vibration, our nodes are designed to withstand that. 
Uh, our tilt sensors have a, a very high resolution and repeatability versus uh, more traditional survey methods. Um, not getting into too much detail around the numbers, uh, but uh, when we look at it, we are we are monitoring always uh, in sub millimeter uh, movement. So these tilt sensors also allow for cross level, twist, and settlement profile measurements, uh, which I'll cover in a slide coming up. The, the nodes themselves are 10 plus years of battery life uh, based on a 20 to 30 minute sampling rate. That sampling rate can be uh, remotely configured. So, you know, reduced or increased whenever needed remotely without having to, to go on site. Uh, but if kept at that 20 to 30 minute sampling rate, we're, we're always looking at a, a 10 plus years battery life. Uh, they are water and dust proof to IP66, 67, and 68, and with a wide um, temperature operating range of, of minus 40C to plus 85. So we're in, in I guess, in most uh, applications, especially the, the group on here today is not going to have any issues uh, with temperature variation. Next, looking at the track bed tilt plus temperature sensor node. So shown here are actually four of these PT100 nodes, which have the combination of temperature, external temperature sensor. You can see the cable coming out of the node here, uh, going into the track. So under here is the temperature sensor itself. Um, and then we have the, the node, of course, which is collecting that information and transmitting that remotely. Following that would be the optical displacement sensor node. So you can see one installed here on a OCS pole. And in the background, we actually have a, um, a tilt sensor node installed on the tie. So the purpose uh, in this case of the, the ODS node is what we call it, which does take tilt, but also in this case is meant to take a displacement measurement. So it'll be aiming right at the web of the rail to measure the horizontal movement. <clears throat> with a class two laser, very similar to most total stations on the market uh, with a 0.1 millimeter resolution. What this allows us to do, information to collect remotely, is track push and pull. It's that horizontal movement, uh, normally correlating it to uh, the effects of temperature fluctuations. Uh, can also be in place, of course, you know, just to measure, um, you know, the, the horizontal displacement or, or any movement that could be induced on the track from, you know, driving pipe under the track or adjacent um, construction or, you know, excavation. Um, in this case, it was meant for uh, temperature correlation, um, push and pull. And then of course we have the, the gateway device. So our, our gateway is uh, LTE 4G enabled flat mesh gateway. Um, again, it's solar powered. It does have an internal battery with about four weeks of backup. In the event that a solar panel is lost um, due to high winds, which we have seen that has happened, um, if it is being charged uh, by mains power and that power is lost, someone unplugs it or it gets cut, uh, you'll have up to four weeks of battery life with also uh, alerts that will come through to, to notify you that the, the voltage is, is dropping. So a site visit can be uh, performed to, to go and perform maintenance before the system goes down. Um, another thing to comment here, which I mentioned earlier, is it does have a manual download feature. So if it is being used in an area where there's poor cellular reception or no cellular reception, uh, you can do a manual download of data if, and in the case, we're not looking for early warning notifications for, for sudden movement. If it's more observational long term, sometimes that method uh, can be deployed. So ease of installation, um, it really can't get any easier. So you can see here, um, this person is applying uh, the polymer adhesive on the base plate of the track bed node. Um, you can see on the concrete tie, in this case, it has been cleaned with a wire brush, wiped clean of any debris. Uh, simply applying this adhesive on a concrete tie and pressing it into place. You could always add uh, screws or bolts depending on you know what material we're going into, but really the installation is simply that. It's just putting it right on the tie and then um, moving on to the next one. All nodes come pre-configured for our customers. 
So it's really just having the, the network layout proper, which we do assist with uh, remotely and, and putting it into place. And then right after installation, what we normally recommend, and I know on a lot of projects, there's the requirement to have some sort of uh, elevation or survey baseline, initial position information obtained. Um, there is a actual pin on the track bed plate, which we do recommend be used so we can see the, the starting elevation uh, or position of the, the node itself, of the track bed node itself. In this case, we have a, a rodman with his rod here, uh, just taking the, the top of tie uh, elevation measurement and using that as the baseline measurement to compare to. So this is a common method that's deployed where, you know, during installation, the, the, the elevation is taken by a survey, like I said, and then the monitoring regime is performed, of course, by the node remotely. If movement is detected, then sometimes, um, you know, a survey team or a crew can be deployed out to inspect, to take another elevation measurement. This method is not always used, but it is used sometimes when there is a, um, a requirement uh, to some sort by a railroad to, to have that, that manual measurement as part of the monitoring regime. So solution overview, um, looking here, of course, we started with our, our sensor network, uh, looked at the different parameters that we can monitor remotely. Um, we looked at the way that the data moves uh, from the node to the gateway, um, how it's powered remotely, how data is transmitted remotely. Uh, and that brings us to the data backhaul. The most common method of, uh, of data transfer is going to be via uh, cellular, so on the mobile networks. Um, in the case where that's not available, uh, we have a little USB icon here which shows that you know data can be obtained and downloaded locally. Um, in some extreme cases, we have worked with customers with a uh, satellite communication um, setup. Uh, we do have a variation of our gateway, which uh, allows the interface uh, with some external communication modules. So after data is moved, it moves to cloud server, um, from where it then uh, automatically populates on web monitor, which is our software, which allows you to view data, analyze data, um, have uh, automatic computation of, of that raw data into uh, certain, um, you know, measurements like cross-level or twist. Uh, it's from where alerts can be sent, um, reports can be created, uh, data can be downloaded. Uh, it's also where the network is configured uh, before deployment, but also during uh, a monitoring program. Parameters can be changed, reading frequencies, um, and so on. We also have the ability to have that data automatically route to a third-party uh, software. So that can be either via FTP export or via API, um, which, we are, which we are enabled with, which does allow data to, to move to a third party. So uh, we, we like to stay agnostic when it comes to uh, the data um, side of things. So finally, um, as we're getting close here to the 20 minutes, what is, what is measured and, and what is computed? I think it's important to define the two here. So first, looking at cross-level, um, we can say that this is measured, and we can say that cross-level is directly measured because the node is going to be installed right on to the tie, and using simple trigonometry, uh, you know, the, the, the degrees that the uh, node moves along the length in the plane of the tie, and the length of the tie, we can uh, compute that, that cross-level change so that's a direct measurement. What we can say is computed is twist by taking those successive um, intervals of cross level and doing that calculation. Um, we can say is computed because it's not a direct measurement. We are we are using the uh, measured cross level from two successive locations to then compute the twist. And then another computed um, value would be longitudinal settlement, which takes um, Similar, similar trigonometry uh, beam chain style method of calculations and applies that to successive uh, ties which are instrumented with tilt nodes along uh, some certain length. All of these are done on web monitor, are done automatically 
and can have uh, their parameters alerted on, you know, either internally to the project team or externally uh, to the the asset owner or, you know, engineer responsible for for the monitoring program. That's all controlled by um, by our customer with their access um, to our software. So again, application example here, um, very typical sort of screenshot of um, of a project. Uh, you can see, you know, each location here, of course, is going to be a track bed tilt sensor node. In this case, what we're looking for is track geometry changes um, in the 10 foot interval. A screenshot here in raw degrees, uh, time series data, of course, of uh, successive locations on the same plot with their cross level shown in raw degrees. Then the automatic calculation in the software of cross level in inches of the same parameters with uh, defined alert values. If it exceeds it, then SMS or email alerts can be sent to um, you know, whoever our customer uh, requests. The twist, the resulting twist calculations, which we covered are automatically uh, calculated as well as uh, longitudinal settlement here. So we're showing two here, accumulated settlement from a start point and then corrected settlement which assumes that the start and end sensor nodes are outside of any specific uh, influence zone. You know, this method works in the case of um, if there's excavation or drilling going on right adjacent to a track um, or tracks being undermined by, uh, you know, pipe jacking, um, that method does work. If, if it's not assumed or understood that um, all the nodes are outside of any sort of influence zone, then the accumulated settlement method is used. Happy to talk about that more if anyone wants to uh, contact me, me directly. And then finally, of course, you know, the, the end product is uh, understanding what's happening to the assets and uh, receiving alerts. So this is a snapshot of Web Monitor showing different types of alerts that are coming through. Totally user configurable with, um, you know, the location names, the trigger descriptions, what parameter was exceeded, uh, the colors that are used. I know there's different colors that are required by um, you know, different um, um, asset owners, railroads, uh, you know, engineers, that's all configurable as well. Um, and then notes can be made in here on alerts, you know, they can be acknowledged, cleared, it's always logged who did that um, and what time that they did acknowledge that. Um, but we're always involved with the customer and provide training on how to interact and use the, the software here. So yeah, getting close, um, wrapping up with a, a project example. To, to show that it's not all conceptual. Um, this is uh, a project done in Sandpoint, Idaho on um, a bridge, Sandpoint Bridge, we can call it. And uh, there was a, a length of um, bridge here that was gonna be impacted by the construction of a new, a new bridge. So while those piles are being driven, uh, there was concern over how the track geometry would be affected. Of course, you know, if the, if the pile of the foundations themselves are being impacted by the drilling of the new uh, structure adjacent to it, because this bridge, this, this corridor needed to remain open during the construction, a very important corridor for uh, multiple railroads. So instead of uh, deploying a different uh, type of manual monitoring method, which would required um, the railroad to shut down traffic while inspection was done, while surveyors or you know um, monitoring engineers walked the track, uh, which have been, you know, unrealistic and, and have, would have had a huge impact to uh, traffic in this corridor. Uh, remote sensing um, with uh, Sensee's track bed um, tilt sensors was deployed here. So there's over 500 of these installed at a 10 foot interval along the bridge uh, and allowed the, the engineer to, you know, in near real time, receive data, understand the track geometry to report that to the railroad to allow them to keep um, traffic moving through the area confidently. So just four minutes over here. Um, I will ask my colleagues to hop back on and pose any questions that maybe did come up. I'll turn my video back on here. Yeah, great job, yeah. Dan. Uh, just a, we did have a question come in during this um, and they were wondering, uh, obviously these are tilt meters, uh, triaxial tilt sensors measuring tilt and you showed that. Um, They're just wondering how that gets converted uh, to millimeters displacement or inches, um, just kind of like you showed in the your slides near the end. 
Yeah, sure. So we have raw degrees coming in here, right? So the, the tilt sensor measures in, in raw degrees. And then in the software, we have the ability to input any custom calculation. Um, if Excel can do it, uh, we can do it. So it's just taking that raw degree and then applying that um, in trig trigonometry in this case to measure the, uh, the displacement. So the angle, the length of one side using trig essentially gives you the, the cross level in this case. Uh, and then another one about uh, more general about the life of the batteries in each of the sensors. I know you touched on that, but just maybe reiterating the battery life that each sensor can can last for. There we go. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so bringing that slide back up here with the tilt sensors. So um, it's actually up to 15 years. Um, it's always going to be based on the uh, the sampling frequency of the sensor node. Based on this 20 to 30 minute sampling rate, uh, we do observe 10 plus years of battery life. If we drop down um, to sub minute, which we have the capability of doing down into the seconds sampling frequency, um, the battery life is affected. It doesn't really drop down until you get down under one minute. Perfect. That actually answers the next question I had here, which was can the user change the reading frequency? So you took care of two and one there. Yep, <laughs> remotely. From your couch on your laptop. Um, and there is uh, one more about you mentioned two different uh, the wireless platforms that Sensive offers. Does the data look the same in Web Monitor regardless of what platform you use? Or yeah, yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's that's correct. The data would look the same if you're looking at a plot. Um, let's say like this for example, you you wouldn't know if that's coming in from Flat Mesh or from GeoAN. Essentially, the two platforms um, are different in nature by their um, their their architecture, I'll say. So the GON is more of a point-to-point, -point, long distance style of um, communication from node to gateway in start topology. And then the flat mesh um, is, is just that. It's mesh, it's a proprietary system to Sensive, it's Sensive's own. It operates on 2400 megahertz where all nodes communicate with one another um, and the gateway, um, synchronizing in microseconds. Perfect, that's all I the ones that came in during. Sorry, go ahead, DJ. Yeah, I've got another question here. A lot of the uh, portions of North America Railroad are in remote areas. Um, how can the technology deal with that if there's no cellular? Yeah. Yeah, if there's no cellular. So if there's no cellular, if you're in right remote areas in Washington state, let's say, you know, in the mountains, uh, mm -hmm. but you still want the ability to, you know, obtain and um, alert on, you know, a landslide, washout, uh, a flood, right? All of these things, um, you know, that can be done uh, either by tapping into any internet source that's available. Sometimes there are cabinets, um, along the way that do have an internet connection we have the ability to connect to uh, an ethernet source um, or it's exploring um, a satellite communication um, modem which we have a variation of our flat mesh gateway which can connect to those um, you know data is not going to move as quickly as it would via cellular uh, but that data still can be obtained remotely great and then right. one more and question what happens if the nodes are underwater? Hey, if the nodes are underwater? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, so the the nodes are up to IP68, waterproof rated. So they will survive um, being underwater. We have a specific uh, IP rating um, that, that states uh, certified up to, if it's under 20, 10 foot of water uh, for 24 hours. Um, you know they'll they'll be fine during that time uh like all radio communication you can't communicate through water so no data would get out once the flood recedes once the water recedes um, as soon as that happens um granted the note is still there uh you know data is going to communicate out um at that point thank you and Anything else? 
We're right bang on target. Oh, that's all from our end. Anything, final words you have, Dan? No, no, absolutely, no, nothing at all. You know, that wraps up, uh, you know, this week's rail, uh, rail sessions, rail webinar sessions. Um, uh, a copy of this one will be sent out to everyone, uh, the recording. And like I said in the beginning, if anyone wants a copy of the previous two sessions, which covered uh, earthworks, you know, slope instability, landslides, washouts, um, or tunnels, um, structures, bridges, etc., um, just message us and we'll we'll get you a copy of that, no problem. All right, very good. Thanks everyone for joining. Thank you, Thanks everybody. Everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.